Now, take a look at this. Derek Chaim Ramchal, another incredible statement. Because when one sensitizes oneself that the honor within a person who is made in the image of God, if I know that I'm created in the image of Hashem, I'm a, I'm, I am a piece of Hashem, which I literally am, we all are. Because man was created in the image of God. Because of this, man is fitting to Olam Haba. Because man is not fitting to Olam Haba except due to the image of God. That's why you're going up there, because you're going back to your source. You're going back to where you came from. You started up there in the first place. Look what it says here, guys. And now we're going to start looking into insights, how to, how to make sure that we're going to get to Alam Haba. Therefore, it says that one should be careful in the honor of your friends. And this is regarding the aspect man was made in the image of God. If I'm made in the image of God and you're made in the image of God, we're all made in the image of God. We're all a piece of Hashem. And what should not, God forbid, embarrass his image? Meaning, if you, you're an image of Hashem, I shouldn't make fun of you. Because you're a piece of Hashem also. And one should not embarrass him. For within it depends Alam Haba. It's a big statement, guys. It depends. You're embarrassing another person, God forbid. Treating somebody disrespectfully affects your Alam Haba. And similarly, it says in Sifri, do not ascend in steps upon the altar. What does that mean? Rabbi Ishmael says, behold, from these words, we can make a logical deduction. And it goes into detail regarding all these specific things. But look what the most important part is. Do not accustom yourself to treat your friends or anybody with disrespect. Your friends is who is the image of who he spoke and the world was created. Certainly should not accustom yourself to treat him disrespectfully. Behold, the warning of one's friend is because he's created in the image of God, because it's the greatest attribute a person can have that you are... I, I always, I'm using this word a lot because I'm getting, I've been living in NMB too long, guys. Mamish, you've been, you're mamish, mamish, a piece of Hashem. Amazing, amazing. Get ready because there's a lot more things coming up, which is going to talk to you about what you need to do in this world to make sure you're getting Alam Haba. And the last post of says on that, and says Rabbi Eliezer, let the honor of your friend be as dear to you as your own to teach a person the ways of life that any he will arrive on Alam Haba. It's very important also to teach other people to help other people in whatever capacity that you have individually as a friend, as an acquaintance, whether you have, um, whether you have any sort of um, leadership role, whatever you got to do to help another person, to educate them, to help them to get to Alam Haba, it's very important. Now look at this next one. Continues and he says, this is a big one. And it says after this, do not be comfortable to anger. Oh, anger is really bad. Barbinan. Moroccans are going, what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, do not be comfortable to anger. Because what it says here, because what's the, if I'm telling you right now, honor is one way of saying, I I'm, I'm, I want to honor you as a friend. So that's good. That's going to help you a lot more about. What happens when you get angry at somebody? It's the complete opposite of that. You're going to be losing the Lama Ba. So he said, don't be comfortable with anger because anger is that which brings a person to the hands of personal deficiency, usually sin. By the way, it leads to all sins. And you got a lot of, if you people have anger problems, you have a lot of different other midot, uh, personal characteristics that are being affected at the same time. You got a lot of things to work on. Anger is the worst. It's the worst. It says specifically that a person who gets angry, God in the Shekhinah goes, see ya, I'm not hanging out with you right now. We're done. The moment you're angry, it's like idol worship, it says. Why? Because for whatever the reason is, you believe that it should be this way, whatever that looks like. And Hashem doesn't run the world. Hashem is the one who creates everything that's going on in your life to the T. Everything. So you get angry about something, that's an Muna problem. That's a faith problem. Because if you understand the concepts and the principles of life, if Hashem is the one who's creating every second of the world, who are you to decide to be upset? Like, right? Like, so to speak. So anger is one of those mechanisms that shows Hashem, ha, huh, you don't run the world. I choose. I'm the one who says it's supposed to be this way. I don't care if it's, a, it should be this way. And that's where you get angry. Whether it's with a situation or whether with a person or whatever. Yeah. Not easy to do, right? I'm not telling you it's easy. I'm just telling you this is what it says. Okay? 
Let's continue. Avigdor Miller, Rabbi Avigdor Miller. Anybody know who Rabbi Avigdor Miller is? Yes. Crazy, amazing books. Highly recommend them. He is no. He is a person. He passed away in the mid '80s, 1980s. He was. He's like like uh, you know, an artist become even famous when they pass away. He's become that. He has become like one of the most important Musar teaching rabbis right now. 2001, I think he passed. 2001? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty Close enough. <laughs> Question. Yes. You should mention things that people need to work on if they have anger or whatever. So. Oh, regarding attributes? Yeah. We'll talk about In that. In addition? That's awesome. Anger? Yeah. That it can affect other parts of your life with anger because anger also comes from the concept mm -hmm. of ego. It's no humility. That's a big problem. Humility is a big thing. Why? Because I'm angry because it needs to be my way. Okay? That's, that's humility. That's another one. What does Avigdor Miller say? Or Avigdor Miller say? Awesome. He says the Gemara specifically points out anger as something that induces the most radical treatments. And now we're jumping into something where we got to talk about too, called Gehenna. Now, Gehenna mm -hmm. is something that we're going to discuss right now. Let me read to you what he says, and then we're going to discuss it a little bit. If a man is prone to anger, all the kinds of treatments treatments await for him in Gehenna. Anger is an illness that will be treated in Gehenna, but a man who is prone to anger should know that he possesses all of the illnesses, and he will have to be treated with everything Gehenna has. That's why Shlomo Hamelik says, remove anger from your mind and remove evil from your flesh, because every kind of trouble comes from anger. Big statement. I almost like I, I should not have put Gehenna there because we're going to talk about Gehenna right now in a couple of minutes. But right now we're discussing specific things that are how do we avoid, or how do we get to Alam Habad, how do we avoid not having that problem with Alam, not getting there. Another reason is this is from Chavod Levavot. Oh, Rabachia Ibn Pekuda, incredible book. Chavod Levavot, Duties of the Heart. Another reason is that a man does not become worthy of the reward of Alam Haba due to his good deeds alone. Rather, he's deemed by God worthy of it due to two things besides his good deeds. There's two other reasons besides all the mitzvahs that you do that you get to Alam Haba. Number one, I kind of touched upon it, but I'm going to repeat it again. And this is for everybody to practice in their own life and whatever circumstance God gives you. That he teaches other people the service of God and he guides them to do good. As it's written, they who bring merit to the public shall be as stars forever. Very famous pasuk. Right? Person who does Kirov, who helps people get close to Hashem. In whatever capacity that you have, it could be a simple conversation with the person who does your nails. And I'm not, I'm not looking at you specifically, I'm saying, right? <laughs> to, to, to the guy who's fixing your car, to your friend, to a group of people you're talking to on Facebook, to whatever. Whatever you can do to help another Jew come close, wow, that's a big deal. What's the puzzle that it says about a person like that? Repeat it again. It says, they who bring merit to the public shall be as stars forever. And you know what Hashem also says on that? The Zohar says that? A person who helps bring people close to Hashem literally gets to hang out next to Hashem, up right next, literally, I want you right next to me. That's the puzzle in the Zohar, it says that. Wow, beautiful. But that doesn't necessarily mean, again, whatever the situation that you have, you can do it. You can do it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Here we go. I put effort into something. It didn't work out. Yeah. Your desire is, and we can talk about this in Kabbalistic terms, is Keter, is the highest. Desire is everything. Look at them. I, I, I'm going to give the analogy. Why not? For fun. Even though, like, I don't know who watches. Does anybody watch basketball? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody watches basketball. You watch basketball, you fall in the heat? Okay, this is just a simple analogy. You have a team who was not good throughout the whole regular season. They just barely, they just barely made it to the playoffs. The Panthers also <laughs> unbelievable, right? How it's all happening in Miami, Miami. Who's my nation? Yeah. Miami. 
Um, <laughs> that's a plug right there. Me, I, me, who's my nation? Who's my nation? The ones that have the most desire to win. Because you know what happens when you have a lot of desire? Sometimes it outbeats talent. And guess what? The Heat's about to go into the NBA Finals, which is crazy. And hey, they might even win the whole thing. What a lesson in life that everybody can learn from. And Panthers are also, <laughs> sorry, hockey too, right? <laughs> Miami, who is my nation? The ones that work hard to win, right? Okay. Are we good so far? How are we doing? You okay? Smile. <laughs> okay. Now. Yes, we're gonna discuss that too. Yeah, we're 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 rounding off. We're getting there. You guys okay so far? You have a bedtime? He has a bedtime. Yes, there is water. If you go straight to the pathway, make a left. There's a water machine right there. Okay. This is the desire that you wanted to honor your husband. That worked. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I, the only thing that I know of regarding whispering into their ears is either if they're sleeping, if you whisper someone's name in Hebrew, they can wake up. So I just, I just, I'll, I'll tell you as a parable, I just heard a story. Um, what did I, I just, I literally just saw, I think it was like yesterday, that somebody sang a very famous uh, Jewish song to somebody who was completely out, comat out. And they woke up. Um, yeah, it was like a Torah, Torah, like you know, whatever Torah lyrics, whatever that was, but a beautiful Jewish song. And the person woke up from the coma. Yeah, it's doing good things, Baruch Hashem. We should all have in mind what's the name again? Yaakov Yitzchak. Isaac, Betzivia should have a complete refuah with all the holy words that are ascending. Okay, Uncle Isaac. Next. Wait, you're gonna say you're gonna say before two. You said two things, and you said one, which was Kiruv. Kiruv. Okay, so that's one, right? right? That was the first one. Now, <clears throat> so that was one, and then it says, let me just continue reading as as we're bringing the, the pasuk down. And also to them that rebuke shall be delight, and on them will come the blessing of the good. Meaning also, like, okay, if you see something, this is where it gets a little tricky. It's hard rebuking somebody. You're not doing something right. There's an art, there's an I know, there's an art to that. You have to know it for the person that is willing to hear and listen. Right? It's not simple. It's not just delivery. They have to be able to want they, you can't just do it to anybody. You have to know the person is willing to listen to you. Then you can do it. Um Fine. So he says that when this person combines the reward for those who he brought merit, meaning you help somebody else and you, with the reward that you help somebody else, right? You're putting together shirim. Yeah, this is what we're talking about, right? So it says, with the reward for the good, then the reward for the faith in his heart and the pa and patient acceptance of God's will, he will be deemed by the creator worthy of the reward, the reward of Alam Haba. And he will also bring merit to others in addition to his own piety. Then certainly he's worthy of the reward is written to them. And to them, the rebuke shall be delight. I mean, whoever you go and make an effort to try to help somebody out in a way to try to, you know, you're not doing something right. This is good. It's a good thing. Now. <clears throat> I'm going to move on a little bit more because I'm seeing the time. Oh. But I'm gonna to go to now. Let's go. Let's go down here. But let's go to Gerhagra. Here's a big one, guys. Yeah. Here we go. But the main way to merit Olam Haba, this is Gerhagra, is by guarding your tongue. That is worth more than guys. Look at this statement. That is worth more than all the Torah and all the good deeds. 
And that's the meaning of the Pasuk in Ishayahu, tranquil woman. Because the Masek Bracha says, because the mouth is the holiest of the holy. You want to be able to, and, and by the way, I saw this. You're going to see it again. I'm going to repeat it again. I saw this across the board in so many sources. This is not like a one-off, like, oh, you should do this. This is everywhere. Let's look at what the Chafetz Chaim says, right? Tzaddik of the generation from the early 1900s. In the book Shmirat Halashon, what does he say? It's known that if one is addicted to this sin, what's addiction of? Lashon hara, chas v'shalom, God forbid. It's very difficult to find any cure for him. As Chazal have said, then in the next world, everyone is healed, except the man of Lashon hara. If so, his soul will suffer great shame eternally. Ay. Then it says, and he's rescued thereby from Gehenna, which we're going to talk about. As we find in Mishnah Tamkuma, the Holy One, blessed be he said, if you wish to rescue yourself from Gehenna, distance yourself from Lashon Hara, and you will merit this world in the next. You want to get away from Gehenna, which is what the Christian people, worldly people call hell, which is not hell, the fire and brimstone as it's described, we're, we're, we're going to go there. We're going to go there. Um, but it's saying, you want to get away from that, so to speak? Get yourself away from the Shon Haram. So serious what it is. And yet, it's something that is so prevalent. More important, as I learned from a different source, than Torah learning and good deeds. Just saying. Next. Are you good so the no, I'm not here to be political with anybody. I'm not sugarcoating nothing. If I sugarcoat it, something that's not good. Okay, next. Um, by the way, for those people that are online, if you guys want to ask any questions on the chat, you're more than welcome to to chime in. Okay, I'll check it at the end and, uh, and I'll answer. Your, I'll ask your question. Now, here we go. Ooh, this is a beautiful one regarding Torah learning. This is from Rav Dessler, Mikta Eliyahu. Check this out. Fortune is a Ashrei Mishayabo Lekan Vitamudu Bayada. Fortune is a very famous saying. Fortune is the one who comes here to Lam Haba with his learning in his hand. Only that which has been acquired through effort and toil. What does that mean? This teaches us that one's Torah in Alam Haba is not, this is so important. It's not evaluated based on your natural intelligence, but rather based on the toil with the Torah. Meaning, like, Okay, so like I put the time, I put the effort. Like, did I understand everything? No. And because I understand everything, does that mean like, oh, so now your Olam Abba is less than somebody else? No. The harder you work, the higher the reward. It's a different system. It's not a school system where you get an A plus because you knew everything. It doesn't work like that. It's what time and effort you put. So for anybody who thinks, oh, I learned, I didn't understand, and like whatever, but like, no, like I worked at it. I, I tried to learn this Gomorrah for an hour. I'm like, okay, I didn't understand, but like I tried. You tried? Well, that's it. That's what's important to Hashem. That you put the effort. Put the effort. Look what he continues and he says. Only that which we told it will become ours, as in our acquisition with our nefesh. Whatever you put into it, that's going to be yours. As we discussed previously, the seichel is merely a tool given to a man. The reason why God gave you a brain to learn, they say, use it, what, for this world? And in Olam Haba, you know what? This brain that you're so Mr. Smart Guy, you know what? See ya. It's not with you in Olam Haba. So we only have whatever we transformed into a spiritual acquisition with our nefesh, with our soul, with our body, that we put effort. That's what counts. Therefore, a chacham, a, a, this really smart, let's make it simple, a smart rabbi guy with a quick mind and a good memory, and he knows a great deal, but he doesn't try so hard with his Torah learning. He's a super smart guy, genius. He doesn't try so hard. Okay, yeah, look at it. okay, I got it. I yeah, know it. Will be an Am Haaretz. You know what Am Haaretz means? Mm -hmm. An ignoramus in Olam Haba. Well, somebody with a weak mind, poor memory, and he knows a little bit, has an enormous degree of work and toil in his Torah, he's going to attain much more in Olam Haba because whatever he possesses through the hard work is his. 
And this is a very big famous statement from Masech Pesachim in the Gemara. What it says, and Olam Haba is completely an upside down world to this world. Those people that are in this world that are on top, they're going to be on the bottom in Olam Haba. And you can imagine who right now is on top in this world. They are in the bottom dung. If they're lucky, they make it. And those that are in the bottom here, all those people that you see, and, I, and I'm going to say it right now, you think about even people, has you can go to Eretz Yisrael, you see a lot of even people, go, oh, you know, it breaks your heart. There are a lot of poor people, they're suffering, they have kids, it's difficult for them, but they still, and they go to learn Torah, and they do the best that they can. Guess where they are? Because they worked hard under difficult situations to still be connected to Hashem. Boop, all the way in the top. It's a completely flipped world. What's well, also called Olam Ha'emes, right? Correct. That's the real truth of the world. Very good. But if someone has it easy in this world, he has a lot of money. I studied Torah, but it's easy for him. He has a lot of time. That's fine. Over there, he's not working. No. No. I have a lot of money. God gives. God gave you the test of money. Yeah? Baruch Hashem. How much time are you learning in Torah every day? You're tested based oh, upon... Sorry. Everyone else is another thing. You're tested based upon your particular circumstances. The way you're being tested is very different than how we're all judged differently. You're not judged like anybody else. So it's all based upon what your life was and who you were supposed to be and how good you could be. If a person is very wealthy, how much time are you learning Torah? Are you taking all your money and giving 20% of your money to tzedakah? Are you? I don't know. Or are you looking to invest it in spending and having fun? I don't know. These are these are real tests that guy wants to see where you're at. Plus, there could also be like a, I'm asking, right? But there could also be like a rich guy, and he seems like he has an easy life. But for him to sit down only two hours a day or an hour is like. And he and he, and he, he does, does and, he, and he still does. But Amazing. Kol right? kavod. Hashem appreciates. I mean, somebody that study two hours a day. Thanks. Good. So over there is a... It's normal that you, a person who's a Jew, should like learning Torah. It so makes them happy. What is the people here who swore they are up, over there they are down? What do you think about that? The people that... This guy was a hard man. He enjoys it. So what? That doesn't earn him high points. Yeah. It does. It does benefit hard points. The question is though, again, how much time are you putting into it? How much work are you putting into it? Just because you like it doesn't mean I'm spending a lot of time on it. Yeah, what happens if you like it and you're having a great... What happens if you like it and you enjoy it, but you are having a difficult time with Parnassah? So now what happens? That's a, That's a test. So that you're going to get tested. Everyone's got to get tested. You ain't going to come out of this world too clean. You have to be tested in this world. Right, yes. just because someone has money... Love you. Just because someone has money doesn't mean they're not tested. Say it again? Just because someone has money doesn't mean that they're... Yeah, talented. on the contrary. People yes. that have a lot of money get tested in a lot of other things. There's no such thing as happiness. Money just brings happiness. That's not true. That's a lie. That's not true. Now, continue. The, the, the time is getting short here. I'm so sorry. Are we going to be done at 10? Uh, <laughs> it's 9.55. Right, keep going, keep going. Let's go. Let's go. We're going to get there. We're almost there. Okay. The guys, here's a famous saying. Famous saying. Famous saying. We say this every day. What does that mean? School of Elijah taught anyone who studies halachas every day. You guarantee you're destined, you're destined for the world to come. As it's stated, his ways, the word ways in Hebrew means halichot. Halichot is laws also. His ways are eternal. Do not read the verse halichot. Don't read the word as in ways, rather read it as halachot. The verse indicates that the study of halachot brings one to eternal life in the future world. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov said, I repeated it, I'm going to keep repeating all the time. What is the main Torah person needs to learn every day without fail? You need to learn halachot. You need to learn laws. Why are laws and world to come, why are they connected? Very interesting. It's like this. What is the end game? What Alam Haba is what? Alam Haba is the end game of this world. Meaning we go to the whole world and let's call the let's just for fun. I'm just looking at this way. The world that we, we were born, woo, we go down. Oh, okay, now we died. Has for 120 years, and now we're in Alam Haba. 
What's halacha? Halacha is literally Torah comes down, then you have the Mishnah, then you have the Gemara. Yeah? And then what happens at the end of the Gemara? Finally, you have the Shulchan Aruch, and you have all Bishra you have all the laws. The laws is the end game of the whole start, which was the Chumash. That's the laws. That's your end game. So end game laws equals end game olam haba. It's the same thing. That's what Rabbi Nachman says. And that's why he also says, look, a person who's constantly learning the laws, you know how to live in this world, period. You know what's right. You know what's good. You know what's bad. You know how to differentiate good and bad. You know what's the right thing to do. So you can make it to olam haba. Duh. Right? That's why it's so important. Sometimes I, sometimes I can learn a, a parsha and, 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 it's, and it's amazing. It's all, it's all good. But that doesn't mean that I know how to live a life as a Jew. No. Because I don't follow the halachas. I don't know. So that's what he's saying. Beautiful. Very important. Again, it's a very important insight. Um, trying to see if I should skip anything. These are all so good. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Okay, let's have some fun with this one. Kava Yashar. I told you before, Kava Yashar is a tense book. Torah, this is regarding the concept of how important Torah learning is, guys. Torah protects a man all the years that he's in the grave. As it's written, in your walking, the Torah will guide you in this world. In your lying down, it's going to protect you. In the grave during death and when you're awake, it shall speak for you in the world to come. It shall speak for you in the world to come. What does the Zohar say on that? When you lie in the grave, the Torah is going to protect you from the deen of this world, from the judgments of this world. And when you're awake, it's going to speak for you. In the world to come, when you're awake after death, it's going to speak for you. That is, it's going to speak good for you on behalf of your body. So that it awakes first for eternal life. Meaning, the Torah is going to say, no, 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 he, like, he learned me. Like, I know, he, he, he's like a, almost like a witness-like, right? These for eternal life. Because they occupied themselves with eternal life. The Torah is literally etz chayim. It's literally the tree of life. And all those words that one uttered in studying Torah in this world are going to stand before the Holy One, blessed be He, and they're going to speak out, and they're not going to be silent. So if there's a chas v'shal, besides the actual part of getting to Gan Eden, and the words of Torah are there, and you're going to be relearning everything you learn, but also when you are learning Torah, you're creating angels of mitzvahs that are going to have to defend you when you go up to Shemaim for a court case. A court case? A court case. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? We'll discuss that. This is so, so much to say. It's like, ah. Okay. There was a movie with that, uh, with uh, James L. Brooks and Meryl Streep called Defending Your Life. Really? He had to bring a disposition, and he goes to the afterlife, and he has to prove him his worth. And Very nice. Good to you. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, it says also like this. Look at this, how important. A person who has a majority, this is from the Yerushalmi, one with a majority of merits and a minority of transgressions will have his minority of light transgressions done in Olam Hazeh so that he can be completely paid off in Olam Haba. I want to repeat what I just said, guys. This is like a big statement, and sometimes people don't understand it, and, it, and it's it's a hard one sometimes to deal with on an Olam Hazeh level. I'm going to say it again. Let's say you have a lot of merits. You do a lot of mitzvahs. You're a good Jew. You know, you're doing all the right things. You're keeping Shabbat, whatever. Learning Torah, waking up for prayers. Yeah, whatever that looks like. You have some small transgressions. You're doing, you you have sins, but it's not so much. Look what Hashem does. This is such a big statement and it should be with you for the rest of your life. Should Asr Shalom, nobody should have to experience it, but understand it in the world of how you see the world sometimes. You, because of these light transgressions that you have in Olam Hazeh, you're going to have to get them paid completely off, get them get, clear them out in this world so that you can just swing through Olam Haba, which means what? Asma Shalom, right? You have, why is it that tzaddikim get sick, right? They have, there's also, they have problems. But why? That's not fair. And on paper, that's what Moshe said. Why is it that the righteous suffer and the wicked are, you know, living great? Can, what, what is that all about? The famous saying goes that better to deal with your stuff in this world than to deal with it in Olam Haba. Right. Much better. It's just lighter? Why is it that? Because in Gehenna, it's not fun. Gehenna is Gehenna. It's not fun in Gehenna. Now, 
We're going to discuss Gehenna very shortly. We're almost at Gehenna. But I just want to point that out that sometimes God goes, look, I'd rather you deal with your suffering here so you could just, boom, you're in Olam Haba and you're in a complete amazingness, ecstasy, being close to Hashem. Tough, because they're like, well, well, that kind of sucks. Like you might think that in your mind, you know, like, but like, that's a truth of life. Right? Now, that's one thing. Now, look what it says here from Yigerd Hatshuva. The reason for happiness and the afflictions of the body is that they are a great and potent favor for the sinning soul to cleanse it in this world and to redeem it from purification in the next world. And this is particularly true in our generations. It's not possible to fast in accordance with the prescriptions and the penances of the Arizal as it's imperative for the cleansing of the soul rescue from cleansing of Gehenna. The Arizal said, look, we have to find ways to cleanse ourselves out from our sins. So we're going to like fast and we're going to roll around in the snow and we're going to create physical like, oh, and like burdens on you. We're going to punish our physical soul. And by us punishing our physical soul by Fasting a lot. Fasting was like a thing. And not because it's cool and unhealthy. Although it, it does help with a lot of things, actually. But they would fast from like Monday to Friday. And they would eat on Shabbat. Fasting was a way to get rid Like when we know people, why do you fast? Oh, because we have to get rid of our sins. Right? That, that, that's part of the, the recipe. Yeah? So here it says that we don't fast anymore. So now in order for you to cleanse yourself, Right, because you want to don't want to go to Gehenna, you will be dealing with certain afflictions, so you don't have to deal with it in the in, in, in Gehenna. Now, look at Nachmanides, right? The Ramban says in his introduction to the commentary on the Book of Eov. Does anybody know about the Book of Eov? Be it Book of Eov, right? Book of Job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did not live a fun life. He was constantly suffering and struggling. He was, he was a high-level individual, but he struggled a lot. So look what he says. Yeov suffered so much, guys. He suffered so much that even the sufferings of Eov for 70 years have absolutely no comparison to the suffering of a soul even briefly in Gehenna. Why? Because the physical fire, this is brought down in the Gemara, that the physical fire is... Like, if you were to touch fire, is one sixtieth of Gehenna. It's only that the world is built by kindness and through mild suffering in this world, one is saved from severe judgments in the coming world. How are they equal then? What? It's not equal then. What's not equal? If all the 70 years is not equal to the... To the... Meaning it's the, meaning the Gehenna's? Suffering is much more. So it's right? like you pay a dollar down here, you get a hundred dollars up there, essentially. It's meaning that the suffering that you have here, because of God's kindness, right, is what I'm saying. Is it's letting saying him it's off. Not equal. It's That's not fine. Equal. That's Hashem's mercy right. for you. Did anybody understand what he said? What he asked? Yeah, he's saying what you said that it's not equal because it's easier here than up here. Yeah. Now here's another one, guys. Who 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 here likes to eat sirdashi shi? Anybody? Okay, for those that don't know, sirdashi shi is the third meal on Shabbat. It's the holiest meal. Holiest meal. So 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 holy that like you have to eat bread because most of the time we eat so much during lunch and we're stuffed, right? So here, look what look look what Rav Avigdor Miller says. Another very important thing for Alam Haba to keep in your mind. Look what he says in the, from the Gemara. Magorish, the Gemara is in Shabbos. Keeping the mitzvah of three meals. The Shalash Shit is on Shabbos. Meaning if you, I said Shalash Shishi, but really, eat all three. On Shabbos saves a person from three punishments. One of which is the judgment of Gehenna. When you sit down at the table during Shalash Shishi, and think about how Hashem created the world out of nothing. That you're eating in honor of that great event. It's going to save you from even a visit to Gehenna. What a privilege it is to sit at your Seud on Shabbat. You have to think what a privileged Shabbat is, what happiness Shabbat is. You're munching delicious food and you're thinking, I'm doing it because Hashem created the world out of nothing and that's going to rescue me from Gehenna. And you can rely on that. Our sages have promised us that. Only if you think that thought? Very I think that the thought is a nice bonus on the thing, but I think the, the, thought, the, 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 the message is pretty clear. But what's the correlation between the 
What? Highest time of the whole week. Yes, it's the highest time of the whole week. Well, what's the correlation between being safe from the and Sudash and Shabbat? What's the connection that with Sudash and Shikoyan at Friday night? Or... Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I think so. Um, and um, Rabbi Nachman also talks about this because Shabbat is one sixtieth of Alam Haba. So you're getting a taste of Alam Haba <laughs> Shabbat every week, if if done properly. So then, how does that say you? It's a it's the conceptual idea that you want to get a taste of Alam Haba. You're trying to live out. Olam Haba, so to speak, to keeping Shabbat, especially with the meals. Why the meals specifically? I don't have an answer for that, but I would assume it has a connection to that. Now, look at this. We're, we're going to leave off the last part. Gehenna, and it's very short. It's not long. And this other thing I'm going to show you right now, to show you that even if you make it to Gehenna, Hazaku Baruch. Look at this, guys. Kava Yashan. <clears throat> You guys are with me? We're almost there. In this chapter, I want to describe briefly the punishment that is suffered in the next world by a soul that has been sullied in this world. You know what that means? That some souls are were so bad that they're stuck in this world. You must know that the atmosphere of the world is filled with human souls that are not yet allowed to ascend to their place of rest, meaning there are souls everywhere. One of the disciples of the Arizal relates in the name of his teacher. He relates further that one time when the Arizal went to study in the field, he saw for himself that every tree was covered with countless souls, as was the field itself. So this field with tons of souls, the tree is full of tons of souls, and even the water. The Ariza asked these souls. By the way, you have to know who the Arizal is. He's like the biggest... Um, Angel in a human's body, in the most one of the most, I would say, going back now, but 1500s, 1400s. So, you know, he is the main person that's brought all Kabbalah, Zohar, uh, all the esoteric teachings, uh, everything that we almost do in practicing in regards to Sephardic for sure, in regards to Sidur, the prayer services, the customs, everything is the Ariza. Okay. He was literally an angel in this world. Yeah, I think he died at the age of 32. He didn't have to live a long life. He didn't have to. 37? 37? Uh, Rabbi Chal is 32. Rabbi Chal is 32. Rabbi Nachman's 38. Arizal's 37. Rabbi 38 years old, yeah. They, all the big guys, they come into the world. They got to do what they got to do. Are you a Kaplan? Yeah. So look what it says. Arizal sees all these souls, and he's asking them what they're doing here. And they respond that they had been banished. These souls were banished from the holy enclosure on high because not only did they fail to repent of their sins, they prevented their companions from repenting as well. So, what happens to everybody has to go all all these Jewish souls are stuck so obviously, there's something to be said about people that were not ready to repent. And not only that, but they somehow, some way, they were that bad that even convinced other people don't do it. Like, Atheists almost like permanently, or they get removed in another person's body, right? Not even these are not even they're not even lucky enough to do that. Can you repeat that one more time? Their souls. <laughs> what? Wait, we're gonna get to reincarnation. People last a long time. Therefore, hear me out. Let's try to finish this out. Wow, it's late. I'm so oh, sorry, wow. guys. I knew this was gonna happen. We should we're gonna yeah, this is the last part. Therefore, they were condemned to wander on the earth. And now they heard a heavenly voice proclaiming that all of the wor worlds that were there was a certain righteous man. There's a guy named the Arizo who had the power to rectify banished souls. And they gathered there to request of him that he have mercy upon them and rectify them so that they may ascend to the resting place and be released from their great suffering. And the Arizo will do that on, his, on their behalf. Right? And that's what he did. And we find that there are countless amount of stories collections of tzaddikim from the Baal Shem Tov, who would literally be dealing with souls on a daily. Rabbi Nachman was literally dealing with souls on the daily. He would take random outskirts to like the middle of nowhere to come back and do tikkunim on souls. There's a whole chapter called the Garden of Souls. He spoke about this. That's what he does. And he does, he does it well. 
and they know how to rectify these souls that have no body and they have nowhere to go and they're just waiting for someone like him to help them. That's the worst of the worst. Now, that being said, get ahead of Ready? These are just wayward souls that just hang out. Yeah, hang out. Planet, yes. They're, they're just, they have no body and nowhere to go. I think they're back. Any form of, any form of clean clothes or whatever? No, they're souls. They're just, they don't have any. It's like a seesaw back and forth from one end to the other end. And they can't find They can't do anything. They're just stuck. Now, let me finish up with the last part fast. Gehenna. What is Gehenna? Gehenna. Gehenna. Yeah? You ready? A person passes away after 120 years. They go upstairs and they have to go through a heavenly tribunal. There's a court case. Okay? You have angels representing you or your defenders. You have the accusers, the Yetzirahara, the Satan. They're all after you. It's a court case. They're it's like a, the IRS. They are the IRS, <laughs> but worse. No, no, they're not. So basically, here we go. You're in a court case. Let's say after the whole court case is done, we're good, whatever, fine. After that happens, right, now a soul has – the, the goal is you want to get to Gan Eden. Olam Haba is made up of Gehenna and Gan Eden. Just to let you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I should have put it down here, in the Gemara it says – Gan Eden is like it's a very big place. Gehenna is like ridiculously huge, which shows you something. Okay, that's number one. What is Gehenna? So Gehenna in the Gemara is called the Valley of Tears. They call it the Valley of Tears. Why? Because you go to Gehenna and you're literally crying of regret. Ooh. You're watching your life. And you're dealing with all of your shortcomings and things that you did, including your personality traits that didn't, that were never polished and that needed to be worked on. And to this moment, let's say you die. Let's say Hakasu Shalom, your person dies and they had, uh, let's say they still had anger. Yeah. Okay. So how do you get rid of that anger? Because you can't go to Alam Haba with that anger. What happens if you have Hasbashal resentment for a person? You can't go to Alam Haba with resentment for a person. Or the other, many other attributes that, God forbid, a person should have. I don't have to tell you all of them. You can pick your choices, pick your poison. So, no. So, the concept of that trip to Gehenna, look at, so there's a very, a lot of different conversations about Gehenna, a, a way of saying it. So people think of Gehenna, they get very scared. The Gehenna is really a gift from Hashem. Yes, but it's a gift that you're allowed to go to Gehenna. Because it could be worse. You can be reincarnated. That's worse. It, it's called purgatory. So the, the analogies, as you can see, that I wrote down, Gehenna is like a laundry mat. It's a laundry mat. Your soul is there, and it's got a lot of stains. You can't go up to the party in Alamaba showing up at the king's meal with like stains on yourself and your clothing. You got to clean it out. Yes. Another wording of it is mental laundry mat to cleanse the mind. Because that's the only thing you have left in there. You are yourself. You are you. Who is, you're not your body. You're you. And you knows what, you, you knows your shortcomings. You know, you knows that. So you're there to cleanse that mind. It's a place of getting ready for the world of Alam Haba in order for you. It's a gift. So you can benefit from Alam Haba. You got to go through Gehenna. It's like a little side path. Even high level individuals have to quick, a quick, uh, I look at it, you know, it's funny. It's like the car that goes to the car that goes to the cleaner. They got to make a quick one. You're like, Wait. okay, yes. It's one of those spots that you just spray a spot. The guy that got in and in this room in Olam Hazel, yeah. no, they're not in Olam Hazel, it's, it's Olam Haba. If he's saying it, he's being also, he's not telling it to you like it's literally mamish, like here, like allegorical, you mean? allegorically, you can be experiencing Olam, you can be experiencing Gehenna. Or you could be experiencing Gan Eden. A person could be very close to Hashem, experiencing the taste of Gan Eden. And yeah, of course, it's allegorical. Or you could be in Gehenna. Gehenna means you're Gehenna. 
Now, and another analogy, and this is, I took this from Rabbi Avidor Miller, beautiful, he says it. Let's say you're going to the party, yeah? You're going to the king's banquet, you're going to Alam Haba, and they're going to serve you, let's say, and again, we're being uh, allegorical here, right? They're going to serve you amazing food. What happens if all your teeth are messed up? And every time you bite, it hurts. What do you got to do? You got to get, you got to fix the teeth. You got to get that surgery. Yeah. You got to do all these things so that you can eat the food. You want to appreciate Alam Haba. We got to get that schmutz off of you. That's Gehenna. And that's the 11 months. Okay. Now, not exactly. 11 months is the latest amount of time that it says that a person can be in Gehenna. The most. The most. The most. The most amount of time. So like That's why we step. Like, they make a stop. It's really a year. See, as far as say a year, Ashkenazim say eleven. But the point of the eleven is to say, oh God, I can't be in twelve months. We make it. We stop at eleven. That's why the Ashkenazim do eleven. That's the maximum. Now, eleven months of Gehenna could be Gehenna. Hopefully you're not there for 11. Automatically, the worst case scenario, then you go to Ghanaian. Now, Ghanaian could be, again, your your level of Ghanaian is different than another person. We go back to the thing. What you put into it. The Gehenom is correct, yes, based upon who you were. Now, look at this. This is the last part. Here's the last part. Very interesting. This is a very well-known thing. Oh, okay. So now we're getting into Gehenna. So there's a very well-known thing. Abraham Avinu. It says like this. Look at the who can't be helped in Gehenna. Look what it says. This is the Gemara Masachet Ervin. Eruvin. It says, Abraham Avinu comes to rescue Jewish sinners in Gehenna. He's gonna pull you out of Gehenna. Why? Because Hashem promised, don't be afraid, Abraham. Your reward is very great. What does very great mean? It means that you're gonna be rewarded. Not only in this world and in the next world, but you're going to be together with your children. Therefore, the children of Abraham are promised they're going to be saved from Gehenna. What, has, what happens? Abraham himself comes down into Gehenna. He plucks his ch children out from there. Look what it says from here. However, sometimes Abraham must leave some of his children in Gehenna. He can't get them out. There are some Jewish men who sin by having relations with an Aramis. The Gemara says, Abraham cannot help them. He only helps those who have a brisk kodesh, who have kept holy the covenant sealed in their flesh. He's not able to help someone who profaned the covenant in his flesh. Abraham does not even recognize him, the Gemara says. Abraham tries his best to take Jewish sinners out of Gehenna, but there are some sinners he can't even save. What's Aramis? Yeah, I was asking. The concept of having relations with a non Jew, a person, an Arabian, a person who's not. Well, we learned so many times there's no sin that you can't do repent for. Correct. You can still do repentance. You're going to do it in Gehenna. You can still do repentance on it. You can. So but he, Abraham Avinu, specifically cannot pull you out. Oh, but the person will still do his 11 months and get out. Hypothetically, yes. Now look at the last part. Okay, hypothetically. hypothetically, yes. So, so when Rabbi Nachman says he'll pull you out from Gehenna also. Which we, forgive me, it's a little bit unrelated. Yeah. So is that considered adultery? Is that, or no? Forgive me for my ignorance. But... Ad adultery? The thing with the Iran is... Adultery is a... It, I would probably tell you 100% goes on the 100% level of not keeping the Brit on the highest level possible. It's one of the worst things a person can do. But that's considered... That Iran is thing is considered... I would, I would assume... I don't want to say it is because it's it's it's... It's the, it's the same idea of not keeping the Brit on the highest level. person who does that is considered, it's like, you know, the Torah is very harsh on that. Well, so it's, not just, it's not just the Sota, then, because there's all this talk this week about the Sota, Sota, Sota. Yeah. And I ask my question, so what happens with the man? It's not considered it's not. just as equally uh, sinful? So they don't, the, 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 man, the man itself doesn't have to go through that procedure. However, the guy who had relations with that Sota, he also blows up. Interesting. Yeah, he also blows up. Don't, don't think that he doesn't get away with it. He yeah. blows up too. He blows up from the he blows up from the comfort of his house. He doesn't have to go to the Beit Hamikdash for that. But this one's just as bad. The Aramis. Yes. Yeah. Now Aramis is all non-Jews. 
Aramis is all Aramis. Aramis is what? Aramis yeah. Daria, the Caribbean, Caribbean. Caribbean person who's not from your from from the fold. Now, this is the most important part, guys, and this is a uh, this is a positive one. Ready? This is a positive one. <laughs> I think there's a lot of positive. I'm going to leave it like this. You ready? The Rambam, 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 Rambam Moimanis. Look what he says. All of the Rashaim, all the evil people whose transgressions are great, a person sinned a lot, are judged according to his transgressions. But they still have a portion of Lam Haba because, as we said, all of Israel has a portion of Lam Haba, even if they sin. And similarly, the pious among the nations of the world, this is what I just said, the pious among the Gentiles of the world also have a portion of Lam If you keep the seven Noahide laws, guess what? You're going to Lam Haba. Which we thought Bill Gates was going to do it, but he didn't. He's not making it. He's <laughs> definitely not making it. He's going to be rotten hell for a long time, and you can count me on that. Now, <laughs> Akiva, that was for you. Now, Akiva, you didn't listen to that one, did you? That was for you. I said we were talking about is Bill Gates going to going to survive? Go, he's going to be you know he's going to be in, in hell for a long time. Right. Well, that was for you. I mean, besides okay. the fact that we don't we don't support the word too, that it's going to be a problem. Oh, we're not talking about that right now. Let me finish the Torah class. The other stuff is a different conversation. Unless we got this here, no? Again, the question would be depending on where you're at. I don't want to. I don't ever want to say every single person does, but I do know. For example, I I I remember there was stories in the Gemara about a high level individual, and he did a and like literally was like, boom, like like a like a faster it was, bam, like done. But again, everybody individually. So some people, maybe some people that are perfect people in the sense in the world that they're cleaned up all their acts. They're so pure. They're so our people are so pure. Oh, but then you also say that if somebody gets a foot in here that that helps them not. Yeah, they get to get rid of all the shmur, the last things that they had left. So repenting means confessing your sin, acknowledging your mistakes, never doing it again, and living a life of complete not sinning uh, in whatever that was. Repenting means I acknowledge my mistakes. I know what I did was wrong. I really feel bad about it. And I build my relationship to really mend it back with God. With, with, with sincerity and honesty. No mishy-washy games. Like, really. Like, I love God. I, I love you. And I'm so sorry that I did that. I feel so bad. That's repentance. So the Rambam, in the last page you could see, it says here, he goes... The list of the people that do not have a portion of Lam Haba. Like if you if you are in this, according to the Torah, you don't have a portion of Lam Haba. But there's an ending to this. Okay, so just don't don't get scared. Ready? Look at this. Deniers of some aspects of God. If you deny that you're, you know, God is God. A picorsim, a very denying the prophecy of God's knowledge of man's actions. Deniers of Torah. Deniers of the revival of the dead. Deniers of the Mashiach is coming. Causing people to make sins, separating yourself, separating yourself from the community, brazenly transgressing. I'm going to sin in front of your face. I could care less. Handing Jews or Jewish property over to the enemies, placing fear upon the community improperly, spilling blood, being killing somebody, habitual gossipers and slanders, which we spoke about how bad that was, and this is a big one. I don't know. Trying to undo one circumcision. How's that possible? I don't know. Well, the Greeks, the, during the Greek... Um, they were trying to... They were trying to... They, well, they're doing that now. Oh, yeah. Well, well yeah, right now, look, at look, look, the LGBT movement is doing a good job of it. Oh, my God, right? Talk about the doctors who are performing that. They're in big trouble. Now, at the end of the day, look what it says at the end. is the last part. We'll leave it with this, even though I didn't get to finish even whatever Rabbi Nachman said. The whole class is on Breslov. Like I told you. Look at this. Look, it says, so important. One only loses his portion of Lam Baba if he does not do Teshuva. But if he does do Teshuva, however, even in private, then he's going to have a portion of Lam Baba. And one can do Teshuva even from the 24 things. There's a whole chapter on, on the laws of Teshuva, which the Rambam talks about, which generally inhibit Teshuva and still have a portion of Lam Baba. So a person needs to learn Teshuva is real. Hashem is waiting for you to come back to him. There's a lot of, as you can see, we went through a tremendous amount of different um, uh, insights and advice how to make sure, you know, to live a good life, a life that's going to be important for you to you make it Alam Haba. There's so many more things to be said about Alam Haba. We didn't discuss reincarnations. We didn't discuss how to live Alam Haba in this world, which is a whole 
other story, which again, it's very late. I feel so bad. But uh, Bezrat Hashem, I hope we learned a lot. I hope we can have, and the, the biggest thing is, we wake up in the morning, going back to the beginning of the whole thing. Absolutely, it's for you guys. We wake up in the morning, and Olam Haba is on our mind, and we go to sleep tonight. Make a conscious effort. We say Shema Alamita, Olam Haba, it's on my mind. Because when a person has Olam on his, Abba on his mind, you know what happens? We're living a godly life. You know what's at stake. You understand what every minute, hour, day consists of, but you know it's important. And that's essentially achieving Olam Haba in this life. Absolutely. That's an ex example of living Olam Haba in this world. And the truth of the matter is, and I'm so sorry, but the last part, a person who connects to Hashem every single day and speaks to Hashem every single day personally, and here's the biggest one, because I didn't go into it, but thanking Hashem, thanking Hashem every single day for all their blessings. Do you know what happens in Olam Haba? You're thanking Hashem the whole time. There's no, God, can I have um, some Parnasa, please? And some good, like, there's no asking in Olam Haba. It's constant, thank you, Hashem. Gratitude, gratitude. You're experiencing Olam Haba in this world by acknowledging all the blessings that God gives you. That's a takeaway right there. I'm experiencing a, a taste of Olam Haba. Right. We were talking about the peak. That was an excellent class. Thank you. Have a, have a wonderful, have a wonderful night, everybody.